Hey everyone, Laszlo Montgomery here after a little break. Since about the time of the uh, Kaifeng Jews episode up until now, I've been uh, consumed by other pressing matters. So regretfully, the CHP had to take a back seat. But we're back today. This is a topic so many have requested over the years, and of course, a lot of my Canadian cousins have waited a long time for this one. Uh, not that they don't know about them already. Today we look at the life of Dr. Norman Bethune. To most China specialists, he's best known as the Canadian doctor who went to China and treated uh, Red Army soldiers in the battlefield, and himself ended up being a casualty of the Chinese War of Resistance against the Japanese occupation. On a simple level, that pretty much describes the, the part of his life that merits inclusion into the China History Podcast, but he was also a man with laser-guided passion for the causes that mattered to him. He was not only a physician, but a poet, a writer, an artist, a communist, an engineer, and technical innovator as well. He had a driving compassion for his fellow man, and this compassion would lead him to the battlefields of Spain and China. I thought, let's try and do this heroic life, well-lived, some justice, and bring his story to all of you. I thought today I'd talk about who he was, where he came from, what shaped him, what kind of guy was Norman Bethune, and what events led him to that hovel in the village of Huang Shirko in Hebei, where he died on the morning of November 12th, 1939. The Chinese know him as Bai Chiu An. He was born March 4th, 1890, in Gravenhurst, Ontario, in Canada. Not that I have ever been to Canada, or can speak for the people there, but around the world, Norman Bethune is often called the most famous Canadian. I haven't read any polls or heard that this was proven. Neil Young and Mark Rosewell, though, must be strong competition. Justin Bieber and Celine Dion, too. He was of Scottish-Canadian ancestry, born Henry Norman Bethune. His parents were the Reverend Malcolm Nicholson and Elizabeth Bethune. Although not a religious man later on, he had a strict religious upbringing. You know, his father being a member of the Presbyterian clergy and all. His early years were spent in and around Gravenhurst, visiting Beaverton, Blind River, Sol Saint, and Toronto, of course. Summers were often spent around the Muskoka Lakes. He graduated from the... Owen Sound Collegiate and Vocational Institute in 1907. He attended the University of Toronto as a pre-med student, briefly in 1911-12, working in teaching English to illiterate lumberjacks and miners up in Whitefish. This is just west of Sudbury. Yes, Sudbury, birthplace of Mr. Alex Trebek of Jeopardy fame. He also served as a reporter for the Winnipeg Telegram. This gave Bethune a first platform to showcase his writing skills. I'm going to read one of Bethune's works later on. He was a rather prolific writer of letters and essays, and you can see in his words the passion and commitment he had to the causes he believed in. After Norman Bethune finished this frontier college program up in Whitefish, teaching English and cutting down trees, he went back to finish his medical studies at the University of Toronto. But not for long, fate intervened, as it always does, to all of us from time to time, and he enlisted in the Army where he served in World War I as a stretcher-bearer with the Number 2 Field Ambulance Army Medical Corps. He was present at Ypres in 1915 and was wounded by shrapnel in that second battle that took the lives of over a 100,000 men on both sides. The 1st Canadian Division performed heroically and victoriously over the Germans who used... Poison gas for the first time in battle at the defense of St. Julian, Kitchener's Wood. Bethune, over the next six months, recovered from his wounds in hospitals in England. And afterwards, he got back to his studies at the University of Toronto and graduated in December 1916. Four months later, prematurely gray and aged from his World War I experience, he joined the Navy and served as a surgeon lieutenant aboard the HMS Pegasus. Yes, before the... Nimitz-class supercarriers, there were these early 300 or so feet long aircraft seaplane carriers. Bethune served on this ship for 14 months. He was 28 years old and was in Paris when Germany surrendered. 
From there, he carried on with his medical studies, interning first at the Great Ormond Street Hospital for Sick Children in London, England. Many of you have heard of this institution. It's the one that received the rights to the play Peter Pan by Sir James Matthew Barry, first baronet. Bethune worked and studied. Bethune worked and studied at the West London Hospital and later up in Scotland, the land of his ancestors, at the Royal Infirmary in Edinburgh. In Edinburgh, he was elected a fellow of the Royal College of Surgeons on February 3rd, 1922. He spent all his time divided up between working and performing surgery and, of course, studying and all-night drinking and partying binges, despite earning a reputation for brilliance as a surgeon, he had also developed a rather flamboyant lifestyle, which he embraced throughout the rest of his remaining years, that is, until he went to China. There in Edinburgh, 34-year-old Norman Bethune met and married 22-year-old Francis Penny. This was in 1923. They were quite a couple, opposites in every way. Their one-year honeymoon, traveling around Europe, was followed up by dazzling success in his new Detroit medical practice. Why Detroit, of all places? In those days, it was the next best place to be in America, short of NYC. And for a Canadian like Dr. Norman Bethune, it was perfect, right across the border from Canada. Detroit was so close to Canada, one didn't even have to live in the U.S. to work there. Once he hooked up with the right physicians in town... Bethune's surgery practice just mushroomed, and the old days with Francis, scrimping and saving to keep their heads above water, were over. With his newfound success in Detroit, money and success just started pouring in. He was a dyed-in-the-wool, communist-leaning man of the people, now living in the world of the upper crust, on the correct side of capitalism for once. From this lofty perch, he saw how... The healthcare system he was championing and benefiting from was only as good as the size of one's bank account. As soon as he achieved all the success and respect from all his colleagues in the Detroit medical community, he became very disillusioned. He found the whole system that he was part of to be very unethical. When he he had his private practice in Detroit. Norman and Francis were happy together, living the good life, but he also gave freely of himself to serve the needy of Detroit's poorest neighborhoods. On the heels of all this success and happiness and hedonistic living, in 1926, Norman Bethune contracted TB. Tuberculosis back in the mid-20s was still considered a probable death sentence. And in Bethune's case, his prognosis was dismal to say the least. For the next several years, Norman Bethune fought the good fight, living in a number of TB sanatoria. There he prepared for the worst and hoped for the best. He offered himself up as a guinea pig in some medical experimentation on a new method of curing TB. This was known as artificial pneumothorax. This is a procedure that allows the lung to heal after it's stricken with TB. It was pioneered in the late 1880s and was still not perfected. But this new and experimental treatment worked in Bethune's case, and he was able to cheat death this one time. By December 1927, he was cured, or uh, sputum negative, as they say in the trade. Norman and Francis Bethune had divorced. So sure was he that he was not going to make it. He knew his life was finished, and he urged Francis to divorce him and go back to Scotland. Once he began to make his miraculous comeback from TB, they married again, briefly before storms overtook the marriage one last time in 1933. It was in early 1928 that Norman Bethune emerged from the Trudeau Sanatorium in upstate New York. He surely must have felt he had been given a fresh, new lease on life. He was in a state of euphoria from his good fortune. From the stuff I've read, mostly on the internet, as he began his last decade as a mortal human being in 1929, he really did live each day like it was possibly his last. Bethune took a position as a thoracic surgeon at the Royal Victoria Hospital, alongside a great pioneer in the field, Edward William Archibald, known as 
Canada's first neurosurgeon and a specialist as well in tuberculosis. These were the years where Bethune embraced the bohemian lifestyle with one arm and medicine with the other and showed equal passion for both. It was during these Montreal years that Bethune developed his great understanding of his craft. In the course of his work as a surgeon at the Royal Victoria Hospital, Norman Bethune pioneered the development of several innovative medical instruments that were used in the fight against that which he hated above all else, this disease caused by the mycobacterium tuberculosis. The Bethune rib shares are still in use around the world today. His table-mounted scapula retractor, known in the trade as the Iron Intern, was a forerunner of the automatic table retractors also used today in many surgical procedures involving the thorax and abdomen. He threw his life into this, and it wasn't just for the sake of finding new ways to fight this disease. What drove him even harder was to study and learn about the social and economic aspects of TB. He knew poverty and TB went hand in hand. He was one of the earliest back in the 30s advocating for free medical care for all, and he walked the walk too. He was giving free medical care to people who were sick and, you know, had been so ravaged by the depression to the extent that these poor couldn't tend to their ailments or those of their children. During this Montreal period, the calm before the storm, in the summer of 1935, Norman Bethune attended an international physiological conference in the Soviet Union. There he was able to observe firsthand how they handled public health care. He was already on board the socialism bandwagon before he went to the USSR, but he came back more convinced than ever that this was the way to go. There was no other way to lift the poor up. He had come back to Canada a committed communist and certain that socialized medicine was the only way to address the health care needs of Canada's poor. Remember, this is the Depression era. Times were tough. In 1936, General Francisco Franco carried out his coup against the elected government in Madrid, and this kicked off the whole Spanish Civil War between the nationalists on the right, who were also known as the fascists, squaring off against the Democratic Republican loyalists. Norman Bethune also had a special place in his heart for fascism. He kept it right next to tuberculosis. Both were objects of his hatred. And being the committed anti-fascist that he was, when he received an invitation from the Committee to Aid Spanish Democracy to go help the Republicans in their fight against Franco's nationalists, like many other Canadian communists, Bethune joined the Mackenzie Papineau Battalion and with 1,500 men was shipped off to Madrid on November 3rd, 1936. He only had three years to live, and he hadn't even been to China yet. One of his signature achievements in his remarkable lifetime, and certainly during his stint helping the anti-fascist forces in Spain, was the development of mobile medical units that were able to perform blood transfusions right in the battlefield rather than allowing the wounded soldiers to bleed out first before being treated at a hospital away from the action. This was the forerunner of the future Mobile Army Surgical Hospital, or MASH units. This was the main focus of the Canadian volunteers in Spain. Seeing what was necessary for the war effort, Bethune went to London to speak with specialists in blood transfusions. After expanding his technique, he was also able to arrange for the purchase of all kinds of medical equipment as well as a truck. He got back to the front and helped to organize the Canadian Blood Transfusion Service. This was by the end of 1936. I read some accounts that said Bethune carried out his hedonistic lifestyle right there in Spain. His womanizing, brawling, and drunken sprees were well known, and it's rumored part of the reason for his early departure from the Spanish Civil War at the end of May 1937. He left under a cloud of controversy, and he knew it was his own actions and destructive behavior that led to him being sent home. He came back and for the next five months traveled across Canada and America to raise awareness and money for the fight against the fascists. When he made his way back to Montreal in June 1937, over a thousand people waited at Windsor Station. That night of his return, he spoke extemporaneously in front of 8,000 people about what was going down in Spain and why it was a mistake to ignore this crisis. Bethune 
had produced a film called The Heart of Spain that served as a good propaganda piece to promote his cause. He went all over Canada and the U.S. showing this film and speaking out for this cause. It really ripped Norman Bethune apart, that in Spain, none of the other world powers would combine to fight against fascism. The whole Spanish Civil War was, what many historians agree, a dress rehearsal for World War II. Franco had Hitler and Mussolini in his corner, and the Loyalists, lined up against him, had the Soviet Union backing their effort for whatever that was worth back then. Wherever the oppressed were in this world, that's where Norman Bethune felt compelled to go. And with the Japanese invasion of China, following the uh, Chi Chi Shi Pian on July 7th, 1937, Bethune's sights turned to that struggle that the Chinese were waging against their Japanese oppressors. Bethune began to speak out much more about what was happening in China during his speaking tour. But no matter how much he tried to use his ways to get the word out and rally people to the defense of Spain and China, the U.S. and Canadian governments hesitated in their actions to stop this aggression. This was a huge source of Bethune's frustration about China. He couldn't accept that despite everything that was becoming common knowledge about what Japan was doing in China since the invasion, no one in Ottawa or Washington was willing to rise in China's defense. While Bethune was able to connect with a lot of people during this speaking tour to promote the heart of Spain, at the same time his communist affiliations turned most people away from him. In the U.S. and Canada, to have been branded a communist back in 1937 had a lot more taint to it than it does today. So he was often heckled at these public gatherings. There was no small supply of fervent anti-communists who tried to tear him down. But he was unashamed of his communist sympathies and was convinced communism was the only way that the poor could get a fair shake. Depending on where you stood on this issue and it was a certifiable hot-button issue back then as it is now, you either loved Norman Bethune or hated him. In October 1937, he went to New York to prepare for his China mission. And three months later, on January 8, 1938, he sailed from Vancouver to Hong Kong with the Canadian-American medical unit to China. He arrived in Hong Kong 19 days later, and at once he flew to Wuhan, to the city of Hankou, He had come with a Canadian nurse named Jean Ewan, $5,000 worth of medical supplies and all the support and best wishes from his comrades in the communist movements of Canada and the USA. In Hankou, 1937, Dr. Norman Bethune gets his first taste of China. He was met there by Zhou Enlai, the future premier, made all the necessary arrangements to have Norman Bethune escorted to Yan'an, and he stayed there for three weeks. He had worked with the poor and the downtrodden up front and personal since his earliest days teaching English and laboring up in Whitefish a quarter century before. But nothing could prepare Bethune for the squalor and desperation he saw in wartime China. He had famously said, quote, Spain and China are part of the same battle. I am going to China because that is where the need is greatest. No Industrial Revolution had come to China to plow feudalism under the ground. China was still ruled like a fiefdom with a thin layer on top, controlling the lives and destiny of the masses of the people. And to support this whole ancient rotten system, foreign imperialist powers insinuated themselves into the middle of all this and profited from China's helplessness, division, and the chaos created by the Japanese invaders. Like any good cause he passionately believed in, Norman Bethune dove in headfirst. On February 22, 1938, he began heading north, destination Xi'an. He arrived there on March 22. Nine days later, after trekking due north, he was sitting with Mao Zedong in Yan'an, discussing his success with mobile medical units during the Spanish Civil War. He urged Mao to consider the idea in aiding fallen Red Army soldiers. Men could be saved if they were given immediate attention or simple blood transfusions. To wait to get them back to the base meant certain death from infection or blood loss. After meeting with the chairman, 
Bethune had proclaimed, quote, The man is a giant. He is one of the great men of our world. I'm sure Mao would have agreed. In April 1938, with Mao's orders, he headed north to bring these mobile operating units to the front lines in this fight to the death between the Chinese resistors and the Japanese occupiers in this second Sino-Japanese war. Mao invited Bethune to stay and help supervise the 8th Route Army, the Pa Lu Jun, to set up their hospital. It was on this project, and in fact for the entirety of his stay in Yan'an, that his path crossed with the great American doctor and humanitarian, George Hatem. Now, those who know of George Hatem will remember him from the CHP episode 62 on four noted foreigners buried at Bab al-Shan Cemetery. George Hatem, who I openly admit I incorrectly pronounced Hatem, was one of the four, in the pantheon of legendary Lao Wai, who came and left their mark in modern China. George Hatem, Ma Hai De, was right up there. He worked with Norman Bethune in the spring of 1938 to get all the necessary supplies and whatnot for Bethune's mission. What was Bethune's mission? His mission was to go right to the front lines of combat, set up his mobile surgical unit, and patch up all these Balu Jun soldiers who were hit by Japanese enemy gunfire and bombs. He operated on these fallen soldiers right out in the open, just like you see in the movies, with explosions going on and bullets whistling through the air. And that's what he did up until his dying day. He worked tirelessly, not only saving the lives of Chinese soldiers, but Japanese as well when they were brought in. He worked day and night, not only tending to these wounded, but also teaching and training other surgical staff with all kinds of life-saving techniques. And all the while, he wrote in his diaries of all kinds of observations and wrote essay after essay about the inequality of medical service in this world. In mid-1939, Bethune began working under one of the heroes of the revolution, General Nye Rongzhen. He arrived in this uh, Jinchaji region and began serving as a medical advisor to the 8th Route Army. Jin was short for Shanxi. Cha was Chahar, the old province that is today part of Inner Mongolia, and Ji, which is an abbreviation of Hebei province. There, Bethune focused all passion and energies into helping the people there inspiring and training doctors and nurses, writing books, and advising on preventative measures to control disease. In these mountains, where Shanxi and Hebei come together, he saw the worst of battle. This was much more backward and challenging than anything he witnessed in Spain. This was pure guerrilla war. Bethune saw how the 8th Route Army soldiers collaborated with the locals to harass the Japanese army anywhere and everywhere they could find them. They carried out all the same acts of resistance that any downtrodden and occupied people try. Disrupting lines of communication, midnight raids, downing power lines, laying booby traps, anything that might cause death or inconvenience to the Japanese. Of course, the Japanese would come back and seek horrible retribution on the locals and commit terrible atrocities. This was inevitable and happened all the time. But amidst all this energy to teach and to save lives, working 18-hour days, Bethune wrote, quote, I am tired, but I don't think I have been so happy for a long time. I am content. I am doing what I want to do and see what my riches consist of. I have vital work that occupies every moment of my time. I am needed, more than that, to satisfy my bourgeois vanity. The need for me is expressed. He cried out to the doctors he was training, Go to the wounded. Don't wait for the wounded to come to you. Once Bethune rode 75 miles to attend to the wounded who were savaged by the Japanese in northern Shanxi, there it was recorded that Bethune performed surgery on 71 wounded patients. Once in March 1939, he was clocked at 115 casualties treated in a single 69-hour stretch of carnage. These mobile units he was setting up in China consisted of two mules that lugged all the tools of the trade necessary to manage the battlefield needs of 100 patients at a time. They were set up around three miles from the front. 
if the Japanese turned out to be too strong and capture by them became imminent, the whole mobile unit could be packed up and ready to retreat into the mountains in ten minutes. Hollywood has brought us the horrors of today's battlefield in 3D, and we see medical technology that boggles the mind. For Norman Bethune in the villages and mountains of China, it was a wholly different dynamic. He wrote perhaps his most famous essay in Shanxi and China, 1938. It was called Wounds. Of his entire body of work, this is considered by many to be his finest. It is a regurgitation of events that went down over one sleepless night of operating on wounded soldiers after a whole day and night of raw carnage out in the battlefield. In this polemical essay, Bethune, the physician, and the activist express clearer than ever before his passion and politics. Let me read an excerpt from this piece. It's a little raw and bloody, so if this stuff bothers you, you may want to hit the fast-forward button on your uh, cassette player. The kerosene lamp overhead makes a steady buzzing sound like an incandescent hive of bees. Mud walls, mud floor, mud bed, white paper windows, smell of blood and chloroform. Cold, three o'clock in the morning, December 1st, North China, near Lin Chu, with the 8th Route Army. Men with wounds, wounds like dried pools, caked with black-brown earth. Wounds with torn edges, frilled with black gangrene. Neat wounds concealing beneath the abscess in their depths. Burrowing into and around the great firm muscles like a damned black river. Running around and between the muscles like a hot stream. Wounds expanding outward, decaying orchids or crushed carnations. Terrible flowers of flesh. Wounds from which the dark blood is spewed out in clots mixed with the ominous gas bubbles, floating on the fresh flood of the still-continuing secondary hemorrhage. Gangrene is a cunning, creepy fellow. Is this one alive? Yes, he lives. Technically speaking, he is alive. Give him saline intravenously. Perhaps the innumerable tiny cells of his body will remember. They may remember the hot, salty sea, their ancestral home, their first food, with the memory of a million years, they may remember other tides, other oceans, and life being born of the sea and sun. It may make them raise their tired little heads, drink deep, and struggle back to life again. It may do that. And this one, will he run along the road beside his mule at another harvest and cry with pleasure and happiness? No, that one will never run again. How can you run with one leg? What will he do? Why? He'll sit and watch the other boys run. What will he think? He'll think what you and I would think. What's the good of pity? Don't pity him. Pity would diminish his sacrifice. He did this for the defense of China. Help him. Lift him off the table. Carry him in your arms. Why? He's as light as a child. Yes, your child. My child. Any more? Four Japanese prisoners? Bring them in. In this community of pain, there are no enemies. Cut away their bloodstained uniform. Stop the hemorrhage. Lay them beside the others. Why? They're alike as brothers. Are these soldiers professional man-killers? No, these are amateurs in arms. Workmen's hands. These are workers in uniform. No more? Six o'clock in the morning. God, it's cold in this room. Open the door. Over the distant dark blue mountains, a pale, faint light appears in the east. In an hour, the sun will be up. To bed and sleep. For the rest of this essay, Bethune more or less echoes the sentiments that were being made at the same time by American Major General Smedley Butler. He was one of the most decorated officers in U.S. military history and a two-time Medal of Honor winner. He had written in 1935 that war is a racket. The corporations benefit from war and make the profits. The people pay the bills and do the fighting. Bethune used his strongest language to echo what General Butler was also saying. And he condemned these pillars of society who were the ontological cause of all the suffering and misery Bethune witnessed firsthand in North China. It was these months, late 1938 and up until his death in 1939, that Dr. Henry Norman Bethune wrote his name into the history books and into the hearts of the people of the new China. 
Bethune saw that the Chinese communists were starving for the necessary funds to aid the people in the territories they controlled. He felt it was more necessary to return to North America to raise money for this cause than it was to remain behind, stitching up soldiers and picking bullets out of the bodies of wounded warriors. He was still making plans for his return to Canada and the U.S. when he was called to the front to handle medical emergencies in Laoyuan four hours by car from Beijing and just northwest of Baoding. It was there on October 28, 1939, that he injured himself. Now, there are two versions of how this happened, but uh, suffice to say, supplies were low or non-existent when fate brought Norman Bethune to this part of North China. He was there, as he had been for more than a year, near the battlefield there in ancient Hebei province. Peking man had roamed there 700,000 years ago. It was the site of the ancient states of Yan, Jin, of Zhao, Cao Wei, and others. In this most ancient part of an ancient land, whilst operating on some poor soul who, history does not say, lived or died afterward, Without surgical gloves of any kind, <laughs> disposable medical gloves wouldn't make an appearance till 1964, Norman Bethune either pricked his finger on a sharp surgical instrument or the jagged bone of the injured soldier he operated on. As the infection from the injury took hold and began to slowly poison him from the fingertips up to his shoulder, in his dying moments... He wrote a letter to his commanding officer, General Nye Rongjun, which said, Dear Commander Nye, today I feel really bad. Probably I have to say farewell to you forever. I am fatally ill. I am going to die. The last two years have been the most significant, the most meaningful years of my life. Sometimes it has been lonely, but I have found my highest fulfillment here among my beloved comrades. I have no strength now to write more. To you and to all my comrades, a thousand thanks. Please send a letter to Tim Buck, the General Secretary of the Canadian Communist Party. Address is number 10 Wellington Street, Toronto, Canada. Please also make a copy for the Committee on International Aid to China and Democratic Alliance of Canada. Tell them I am happy here. Please give my Kodak Retina 2 camera to Comrade Sha Fei. Norman Bethune, 4.20 p.m. November 11th, 1939. The septicemia that set in following the injury he sustained during surgery on an infected head wound of a fallen comrade ultimately killed him. And Dr. Norman Bethune died in the morning of November 13th, 1939. His body was transported by his medical team for four days along icy mountain paths. 10,000 Chinese later showed up to file past his body and show their respects. On December 21st, a month and a week after Dr. Henry Norman Bethune passed from this earth, Chairman Mao immortalized him forever when he released this essay called Ji Nian Bai Chiu En, in memory of Norman Bethune. I'll just read some excerpts for you. It's about one page and sort of encapsulates why he became such a beloved figure in the conscience of the Chinese people. Mao had written, Comrade Norman Bethune, a member of the Communist Party of Canada, was around 50 when he was sent by the Communist Parties of Canada and the United States to China. He made light of traveling thousands of miles to help us in our war of resistance against Japan. He arrived in Yan'an in the spring of last year, went to work in the Wutai Mountains, and to our great sorrow, died a martyr at his post. What kind of spirit is this that makes a foreigner selflessly adopt the cause of the Chinese people's liberation as his own? It is the spirit of internationalism, the spirit of communism, from which every Chinese communist must learn. Comrade Bethune's spirit, his utter devotion to others without any thought of self, was shown in his great sense of responsibility in his work and his great warm-heartedness towards all comrades and the people. Every communist must learn from him. No one who returned from the front failed to express admiration for Bethune whenever his name was mentioned, and none 
remained unmoved by his spirit. In the Shanxi, Chaha'er, Hebei border area, no soldier or civilian was unmoved who had been treated by Dr. Bethune or had seen how he worked. Every communist must learn this true communist spirit from Comrade Bethune. Comrade Bethune was a doctor. The art of healing was his profession, and he was constantly perfecting his skill, which stood very high in the 8th Route Army's medical service. His example is an excellent lesson for those people who wish to change their work the moment they see something different, and for those who despise technical work as of no consequence or as promising no future. Comrade Bethune and I met only once. Afterward, he wrote me many letters, but I was busy and wrote him only one letter and do not even know if he ever received it. I am deeply grieved over his death. Now we are all commemorating him, which shows how profoundly his spirit inspires everyone. We must all learn the spirit of absolute selflessness from him. With this spirit, everyone can be very useful to the people. A man's ability may be great or small, but if he has this spirit, he is already noble-minded and pure, a man of moral integrity and above vulgar interests, a man who is of value to the people. The three phases um, of his life that are most remembered, you know, his days as an extravagant, hard-drinking, hard-partying, pioneering thoracic surgeon in Montreal and Detroit, then his groundbreaking contributions to combat medicine in Spain, and his tireless devotion to the Chinese people. You know, being a Communist Party member and such a die-hard progressive liberal made Norman Bethune a somewhat polarizing figure. Not everyone liked him. If not for Chairman Mao lionizing him like he did, perhaps we might not even be talking about him today. He would have simply been one of, perhaps... Hundreds or thousands of Westerners who had anonymously made their mark in some big or small way. He fought against the oppression of Depression-era Canadians and Americans down on their luck, winding up on the wrong side of the line that capitalism sort of draws in the sand. You see, what Bethune learned when he became a doctor early on in life was that politics and economics had a direct link to public health and hygiene. Song Ching Ling, Madam Sun Yat-sen, said of Norman Bethune that he was a world hero. Quote, he lived, worked, and fought in three countries. Canada, which was his native land. Spain, where forward-looking men of all nations flocked to fight in the first great people's resistance to the darkness of Nazism and fascism. And in China, where he helped our guerrilla armies to capture and build new bases of national freedom and democracy in territory which the military fascists of Japan fondly hoped they had conquered, and where he helped us forge the mighty People's Army which finally liberated all China. In a special sense, he belongs to the peoples of these three countries. In a larger sense, he belongs to all who fight against oppression of nations and of peoples. Madam Sun also said, quote, These things Dr. Bethune accomplished amid conditions such as no medical man without a broad understanding of his task could possibly have coped with. He accomplished them in mountain villages in the most primitive parts of China, almost without any previous knowledge of the language, of the people among whom he worked, and without any strength in his own tuberculosis-ravaged body apart from his burning conviction and iron will. She summed up what he meant to China and declared, quote, The new China will never forget Dr. Bethune. He was one of those who helped us become free. His work and memory will remain with us forever. Song Qingling, by the way, condemned her brother-in-law, Jiang Kai-shek, personally for blockading the ports of China that prevented necessary drugs and medical supplies to get to the interior of China. She said Bethune could have been saved if there was any supply left of sulfur drugs to treat him. There are Norman Bethune statues, parks, colleges, scholarships, schools, awards, and whatnot all over China and in Canada, in the U.S. as well. You can visit his tomb in the city of Shijiazhuang in Hebei province. He is interred at the Martyr Cemetery there. As I said, there's no shortage of source material from his life. He was a 
very prolific writer, left behind a whole bunch of paintings, drawings, and photos, too. Just go on the good old internet and feel free to get lost for a few hours. There is plenty of information on Norman Bethune and videos as well to keep you busy. There's also the uh, 1990 Hollywood production starring one of my all-time faves, Donald Sutherland. Uh, Bethune, The Making of a Hero, with Dame Helen Mirren playing Frances Penny Bethune. Well, she didn't get her DBE until 2003. This was quite a life. So, that's it, everyone. Sorry again for the delay. And to all my cherished listeners from St. John's to Whitehorse and all points in between, I hope I didn't offend ye with my meager attempts to get the word out about your great national hero. You don't have to agree with his politics. What Norman Bethune was able to achieve in his short life and to be able to be held up to more than a billion people as someone to admire and model themselves after, isn't too bad of a legacy. He was blessed with great personal gifts. Despite his character faults and all his affairs and whatever other dirt has been dug up by now, this was a giving man in the end, and well worth knowing about. Take care, everyone, and it's among my highest of hopes that you'll join me next week for another exciting episode of the China History Podcast.